At the mouth of the Chicago River, where the city's steel and glass skyline meets the endless horizon of Lake Michigan, lies a site that once symbolized both unbridled ambition and crushing disappointment. For years, passersby peered through construction fences at nothing more than a vast water-filled pit, a hole in the middle of Chicago. It was not simply an abandoned lot, but the foundation of what was supposed to be a twisting 2,000-foot colossus that promised to be the tallest skyscraper in the Western Hemisphere. Instead, the project collapsed under the weight of the 2008 financial crisis, leaving behind a scar that mocked the city's lofty aspirations. But Chicago, a city that invented the skyscraper and rebuilt itself from the ashes of the Great Fire, has never been one to leave voids unfilled. Today, that very site is stirring back to life with a project both ambitious and pragmatic. Far from a reckless gamble, it is a carefully planned pair of towers designed to reconnect the city to its riverfront, deliver long-promised public space, and reclaim a wound in the urban fabric. Today, let's delve into the $1 billion 400 Lakeshore project. Don't forget to click on that subscribe button and like this video as it's the best way to support this channel. For years, Chicagoans and visitors alike could not help but pause when passing the north bank of the Chicago River at its meeting point with Lake Michigan. Behind fences and weeds lay an immense circular pit, partly filled with rainwater, a strange void in the middle of a city celebrated for its skyline. To many, it was simply an eyesore, but to others, it was a wound, a scar left by an ambition that never materialized. That foundation was meant to anchor the Fordham Spire, later rebranded as the Chicago Spire, an audacious project that sought to redefine the city's identity on the world stage. In 2005, developer Christopher Carley of the Fordham Company announced plans for a twisting 116-story tower designed by Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava. Rising nearly 2,000 feet, it would have been the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere. Each floor was set to rotate slightly above the one below, creating a graceful corkscrew that Calatrava likened to smoke curling skyward. Inside, the spire would house luxury condominiums, a hotel, and a broadcast antenna at its crown. Chicago embraced the vision enthusiastically. The city that gave birth to the skyscraper seemed destined for such a bold new icon. And by 2006, the spire had secured all necessary approvals. Construction began the following year with the excavation of a massive pit, more than 70 feet deep and 100 feet wide, supported by caissons that would have anchored one of the tallest structures ever attempted. For a brief moment, it seemed Chicago was on the verge of reshaping its skyline forever. But architecture, however visionary, cannot escape economics. The 2008 global financial crisis decimated credit markets, dried up financing, and left luxury real estate developments across the world stranded. The Chicago Spire was one of its most famous casualties. After Christopher Carley's Fordham Company struggled to secure the massive financing required, the project was taken over by Irish developer Garrett Kelleher, owner of Shelbourne Development Group, who rebranded it as the Chicago Spire. Yet, as the recession deepened, Kelleher's firm could not obtain the capital to carry construction forward. Work stopped after the excavation and foundation work, and the site was left abandoned. Legal battles, foreclosures, and unpaid loans followed. By 2010, the site was effectively frozen, with only the gaping foundation hole to show for the grand ambitions. In 2014, after years of stalled negotiations and litigation, the property was finally transferred to Related Midwest, a large and well-capitalized developer with deep experience in Chicago. With that, the spire was officially dead, and the city was left with the question, what's next? For more than a decade, the hole remained untouched, a physical reminder of the risks of excess, but also a site brimming with potential for future redevelopment. Related Midwest spent years studying the site, consulting with architects, city officials, and the public before unveiling a new plan in 2018. Rather than attempt another record-breaking tower, 
the developer proposed a more measured but still ambitious project, 400 Lakeshore. Designed by Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill, one of Chicago's most storied architecture firms, the plan calls for two elegant glass towers rising from the site in phases. The North Tower, currently under construction, will rise 72 stories to a height of roughly 875 feet. The South Tower, planned for a later phase, will stand 60 stories tall, reaching about 765 feet. The design is deliberately different from the singular monumentality of the spire. Instead of one colossal tower, there will be two sibling structures, angled and staggered so that they frame views of the river and lake. Their facades are articulated with subtle projecting bays, an updated interpretation of the classic Chicago window, giving them texture and depth. At ground level, the towers are set back to allow for a new public plaza, extensions of the Chicago Riverwalk, and improved pedestrian connections. Most significantly, the project is tied to the long-delayed DuSable Park, a 3.3-acre green space just east of Lakeshore Drive. Related Midwest has pledged $10 million to help complete the park, linking private development with a long-promised public amenity. The first tower will contain around 635 rental apartments in a range of sizes, from studios to larger family-friendly units. Beneath it will be several levels of below-grade parking, about 300 spaces in total, carefully hidden to preserve the riverfront for people rather than cars. The podium will host amenities such as fitness centers, lounges, and co-working spaces. While higher up in the tower, additional amenities will be distributed to provide residents with panoramic views. The step design of the facade will also create terraces and outdoor spaces on the upper levels, turning height into usable living space. The second tower, planned for the southern part of the site, will be shorter at about 60 stories. Its program has been left flexible. It may hold more apartments, condominiums, or even hotel functions, depending on market conditions when construction begins. This phased approach allows the developer to respond to economic realities while ensuring that the public realm improvements, such as a new waterfront plaza with gathering space, an extension of the Riverwalk for pedestrians, and funding to finally build DuSable Park, a long-promised green space at the river's edge, are delivered with the first phase. Together, the two towers will transform the long vacant site into a landmark residential development and civic gateway, framing the river's mouth while enriching the skyline and opening the ground to new public spaces. After years of planning and securing approvals, Related Midwest obtained financing for the North Tower in early 2024, raising around $500 million for the first phase. In June 2024, a ceremonial groundbreaking took place, symbolizing the start of above-ground work. The early months were devoted to filling and stabilizing the old spire pit, which required massive amounts of concrete and re-engineering to ensure safe foundations. By early 2025, the North Tower had risen well above street level, and by mid-year, the structure had passed its 30th floor, with curtain wall installation following close behind. The timeline project's completion of the North Tower in 2027, at which point the first residents will move in and the public plaza and Riverwalk connections will open. Duzabal Park is slated to move forward in parallel. Once the North Tower is stabilized and leased, related Midwest will assess market conditions and decide on the timing of the South Tower. This cautious, phased approach is a direct response to the lessons of the Spire era when overreach and financial fragility doomed a project of even greater ambition. The challenges facing 400 Lakeshore are both technical and symbolic. Technically, the site is complex, sitting at the confluence of river and lake with difficult geotechnical conditions. Building atop a former excavation requires careful engineering, and the logistics of constructing a super-tall tower on a constricted waterfront site are daunting. Symbolically, the project must overcome the legacy of the spire. It cannot afford to stall or leave the city with another half-finished dream. Yet the benefits are significant. Chicago gains hundreds of new housing units in a prime downtown location, helping to meet demand in the urban core. 
The city also gains new public amenities, an expanded riverwalk, a lively plaza, and finally, the completion of Dusable Park, which has been promised for decades but never delivered. Architecturally, the towers will add elegance to the skyline without overwhelming it, their twin forms reflecting both the lake's horizontality and the city's vertical dynamism. Looking forward, the project represents a new model for urban development in Chicago. Where the spire embodied a kind of hubristic singularity, 400 Lakeshore emphasizes balance between private development and public good, between height and livability, between ambition and pragmatism. By 2027, if the North Tower opens as planned, Chicago will have transformed one of its most notorious scars into a new civic gateway. And if the South Tower follows, the pair will anchor the city's waterfront for generations, not as a monument to excess, but as proof that vision, when grounded in reality, can still redefine the skyline and reaffirm Chicago's legacy as the city that builds the future. What do you think? Will 400 Lakeshore be a success, or will it face the same fate as its predecessor? Leave a reply in the comments section. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next video.